Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Todd and Shane's Cloudy Podcast number 383, recorded live Wednesday morning, April 4th, 2018. I am your host, Todd Clint, and if you want to tell me how great my stubble looks or how awesome my Trans Am t-shirt is, you can uh, email me, Todd, at ToddClint.com or hit me up on Twitter, at Todd Clint. Shane, tell the nice folks a little bit about you. Well, so I am Shane Young. I'm the guy who put on a shirt with a collar. Um, I also did not shave, though, but I haven't shaved like a day or two ago. Todd, it's been like a month. Different story. Uh, um, but yeah, I'm with the old Bold Zebras peoples over there. Woo! right about there and getting you seasick trying to point to it um so you can hit me up at bold zebras you can tweet me at shane's cows um you know people have been pretty uh pretty engaged lately actually hitting me up uh, just this morning i was working with a guy who's like i watched your youtube video you're so famous can you fix my problem i'm like i'm not but yes so yes well and and it, we have for so several weeks now we've been teased with the thing over your left shoulder and i see that we're still being teased with it we are we are i because unfortunately, right, so this is one of those things where I created this new thing I want to show you over my left shoulder. That's my left shoulder. <laughs> that one. Um, right, I'm looking at the mirror. It's hard. Um, <laughs> but then I got so busy with doing a bunch of the thing that the new thing is going to do that I haven't had time to actually launch the new thing. So it's... I, uh, we're we're all sitting here with bated breath about the new thing. Um, so, and, and so that, and I bring that up to build anticipation. So people's breaths will be even more baited. I don't know. Um, so speaking of anticipation, but, when can they anticipate the, uh, the podcast going live? So they can watch it? <laughs> uh, well, I haven't done last week's yet. So if you remember, I was a couple of weeks behind because of vacation and all that. And I got all those done. And then we did last week's podcast and I had just done a podcast. So in my head, I had done the podcast. And then I realized this weekend I haven't done the podcast. So still building anticipation for 382. <clears throat> Try real hard not to do uh, the same thing for 383, but it's what, April of 2018 now. So I have a good feeling. I like June. June is a good month. It's very springy, weddings. It's good, good month for producing podcasts. Well, you know, and you really, I mean, you missed the chance to put it out on April 1st. And I, I don't know about you, but I was really excited that April 1st was on a weekend, right? A Sunday this year. So most of the internet stupidity that happens on April 1st was, it was kind of kept down. Yeah. Bit. Yeah. I, and and I, I did think it was funny. Uh, and I, and I, I mean this not disrespectfully at all, but it was also Easter. And so there were a lot of crossover jokes between Easter and, uh, April fool's day. So that was, yeah, it was weird. It was on a weekend. It was on Easter. All, uh, all that. Uh, but I will try to get on this. I got a couple things going on today. Um, but I will try to get the production stuff out. Not too late. Very um, cool. What, uh, so other than that, I think production wise, uh, you know, maybe we'll just mention that in a quest to continue to make this live show better, uh, hey. I called up the meanies at the local telco and have yeah. doubled my bandwidth. Um, so and, they, and what impact has that had at your desktop then? Doubling your bandwidth well, should so the, be amazing. The good news is, is that my upload went from like 20 meg to 75 meg. That is good. My download went from 100 meg to 100 meg. What hmm. could that be? I wonder. That number sounds familiar to me. What could possibly be that? Yeah. So those of you that aren't networking people, between uh, Todd and I, we're pretty certain that somewhere between where my modem comes into my house and goes to my router, and then the 17 switches I have between here and there, it turns out, which I didn't realize until I had to tell Todd all of them. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we think that somewhere along the way I'm getting downgraded to a 10 meg connection because, you know, the router, he's getting a gig and my local desktop is getting a gig, but we're guessing that somewhere in between there is a hundred meg, uh, connection. Yeah. Um, so to give you guys some idea what it looks like, I believe that Rube Goldberg was, uh, Shane's network uh, architect. <laughs> so as he's telling me this, so as you can imagine, I believe about one out of a hundred things that comes out of Shane's mouth. And as he's telling me about how his, how the internet, how the, the packets, what is it? The balls that Ted Stevens talked about that go through the tubes. As he's telling me the story, I thought he was screwing with me. Like I thought he was just making this up and I'm like, no, no, really. It can't have been all that. He's like, no, that's real. I'm like, no, that, that makes no sense. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, some little clarity there. Well, what happened is 
when I had networking put into the house, right, when we moved in, I literally spent a whole bunch of money to have network cables ran to all the rooms everywhere so people like Todd could be jealous because he can't do that. Uh, I can't do that. Um, but I did it all based off of that location that's over there that you can't see being the po entry point for the network. I changed providers. The entry point for the network is now way over there. What? One floor and on an opposite corner of the house. Yeah, so that added a little more um, shenanigans into my networking architecture. Um, yeah. Also, uh, Mark asked, you know, what about the Disney Circle? We all know that that has been causing a lot of issues. Also, yeah, that little um, that little guy. I still love the service. I still love conceptually, but that hundred meg, it the Disney Circle had to go. So he's been shut down. Um, yeah. The thought process, and this will be after I solve this networking issue is that uh, Todd and I have talked about maybe trying to redesign my network so that there's a kid's network, right? Because they're always only just on wireless. So could I add a wireless access point to my current wireless router and only let the kids feed off the access point and then put the circle just in that network? So I don't know. Right yeah. now my kids can just get to the whole internet. What could go wrong with that? Yeah, and that is something um, as, a, you know, as a parent and, and our schools use Chromebooks all the time. And there's just a bunch of really legitimate reasons that my kids need to have internet access, but I haven't quite got it all figured out how to keep them from wasting a bunch of time and getting exposed to bad things. And <clears throat> so this is, this is a conversation that I like having because it's a problem I need to conquer as well. Yeah, it's uh, it is a legit problem, you know, it's, it is complicated, right? I mean, I can see why the average bear can't figure this out, right? I mean, you and I have, about as much networking experience as you can without working at an actual telco, you know, doing yeah. wide area network stuff. I mean, local area, I feel like I've done it all and my, my house is the problem. Yeah, I think for for me, sadly, the thing that will finally make me do this is I've started putting Hue lights in my house, Philips Hue lights. And I put them uh, in my kids' rooms because my kids, uh, you know, they want it bright when they go to sleep because they're afraid of the dark and all that like little kids are. But I don't want the lights on all the time. So I've got, uh, you know, the ability in the Hue app, I can dim my kids' lights at like 1030 or whatever and leave them on like a nightlight. All this functionality is great, but now my kids can't easily control their lights. I mean, they can toggle the switch and it comes on full and all that, but like my my kids can't dim their lights to 50% or any of that kind of stuff. And what's the solution to that? Well, they've all got little Android devices here and there. We put the Hue app on them, but then they need internet access and all that. And so that's going to end up being the thing. Um, I think that makes me finally figure out what their internet situation looks like. So, so not protecting your children from the evils of the internet. That's not important, but no, no. Internet needs to have light bulbs that cost like $47 a piece wired up more, more fun. You found them for $47 a piece. You got to send that link to me. I've been paying. Yeah. yeah. I, I tried to buy the kids some, I was going to buy them some for Christmas. Um, it was a whole joke. Uh, Luke's ceiling fan had some light bulbs that were out for a long time. And I was like, you know, for Christmas, I'm going to buy the kid a light bulb finally. And I'll buy him one of those on so <laughs> his iPad. And uh, it, was, it was literally like 45 bucks for that light bulb in that size, right? Because there was no competition. Only one person made it. And I was like, yeah, yeah that's not happening. So kids, Yeah, in all seriousness, uh, the, for my kids, it's just desk lamps. And I think, and I, and I just have white bulbs, so I think they're fifteen dollars a piece, something like that. Um, ridiculous amount for a light bulb. Don't get me wrong, but not as ridiculous. Yeah. As you know, like the colored ones I have up here and all that. Um. So let's go on to the topics. No, <laughs> this is more ahead. fun. We're, we're 10 minutes, but it's, it's fun in the chat room. So everybody's talking about that. I mean, everybody in the chat room is the same, uh, you know, demographic as us roughly, uh, got kids and all this kind of stuff, home networks. Uh, so me, we might have to do a show on this kind of like we did the cord cutting show. We might have to do a home networking show, uh, things like that. Oh, crazy. All right. What do what, what we got into reality? Do you want to start with a, is that, is that oh. guys most excited? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, had a customer. I'm going to get and bored this is one of those. Hang on, hang on. Let me put my board face on. Okay. There you go. The, uh, the is Todd still talking face? That's a, a face I know well. <laughs> um, so I had a customer that I set SharePoint 2016 up for a few months ago. And a, a, as a SharePoint consultant, I mean, there's just a lot of conversations you have to have. As I'm setting up your SharePoint server, I have to ask them, are you sure you don't want Office 365? Are you super duper sure you don't want Office 365? You know, have those kind of comments. Yep. The other one that I always have is, should this all be HTTPS? 
And the answer to that is yes, it should all be over S SSL TLS. Um, this particular customer, you know, it's a big company, so there's a lot of layers of stuff and they didn't, uh, didn't go for SSL when I set the thing up and I had conversations with them and the guy that I was dealing with his, uh, rationale was mainly the process behind getting the certificates and working with the security folks and all that was going to be cumbersome and slow things down. And he didn't see the immediate value to it. I get it. Not a bad decision, but we, we had it. So anybody want to guess what happens after this thing gets into production? Um, somebody says you have to have SSL. <laughs> yeah, they sure do. Um, and that happens all the time. And again, I don't, uh, I, I'm not dinging on the guy. If he listens to this, he knows who he is. He, he knows the conversation. Um, and so it was fun because it was SharePoint and OOS, you know, uh, Office Online Server, uh, OWAs, and getting all that working. And I've done this a bunch of times. And so the guy that I was working with uh, tried to do it himself, smart guy, and it just wouldn't work for him correctly. And he had extended the web app and done some stuff and there's some odd little things. And so I said, okay, no problem. That's not the way that I normally do it. I normally just add an AIM, undo all your stuff. Here's some screenshots. You're all good to go. Work. It'll work every time. It's worked for me every time. Didn't work for him. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we got on a call and sure enough, it didn't work and it was an, an odd thing. And so, you know, immediately I, I set it all up. It doesn't work. I immediately put on my troubleshooting hat. I start breaking things down into chunks. And one of the things that you and I have done since the beginning of time is we, in every SharePoint server's host file, we point that server at itself for SharePoint. Every web app points to 127.001, all that. And so I'm like, all right, open them all up. Let's start doing this. And the testing he had been do doing was from his desktop. SharePoint didn't work. And when he would try to go there, as soon as he would flip over to HTTPS, he would just get a correlation ID, just an unexpected error. Um, so hop onto every server. And it worked on some servers, didn't work on some other servers. And what we found out was it didn't work on any server that was running the distributed cache. Uh -huh. So worked on the app servers, didn't work on the web front ends, didn't work from the desktop. Okay, good. And the errors that we were seeing were vague, but suggested that was the case. And so I was asking him, I'm like, you know, did you do IIS resets? He's like, absolutely. I'm like, did you reboot the boxes? He's like, absolutely. I'm like, really? Cause I feel like the reboot, that's the, that's the thing. Yep. Um, so what we ended up having to do is, uh, restart gracefully shut down the distributed cache service and gracefully start it back up. And that absolutely fixed it. So somehow, somewhere, the distributed cache was grabbing his user's token to HTTP. And then when he would try to log in with HTTPS, it would say, hey, there's shenanigans here. Uh, and it wouldn't let him in. And so another uh, troubleshooting step that we took was I had him log in. After we switched to HTTPS, he logged in with his regular user, correlation ID, no suit for you. I had him log in as another user. He had a test user that had not logged in. So the distributed cache knew nothing about this user, yep. worked like a champ. Uh, and so that told me something's cached somewhere. Um, but that was a fun little problem. I haven't gotten to spend that amount of time troubleshooting and really digging into an issue and pouring through logs. The nerd high that I had at the end of that, <laughs> oh, it was, uh, it was glorious. Um, so that uh, that was a fun story, and it was just a good one. The distributed cache is a scary thing for SharePoint admins, for and it's got a well deserved reputation. Yes. Uh, but it can be bested, can be beaten. Yeah, and apparently it turns out you just got to click the button in Central Admin to shut it down, and that that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that was it. So I had a, a PowerShell script to gracefully shut it down that I'd used in 2013. I ran that; it didn't work, uh, and I'm like, well, okay. Yeah, in 2016, the restart uh, in Central Admin. Um, so in the chat room, while I've been blathering on and on, yes. uh, a bunch of the folks have been talking about certificates and all that. I'm with you. Every time I set SharePoint up, I just put certs everywhere. I understand why people don't, especially test environments and things like that. Um, and even and so uh, Dave Aykroyd and some folks are talking about even you know signing their PowerShell scripts with certificates. I know Shane's done that for his stuff. Yeah, you just got to do that these days. So do you even do central admin? I do not do central admin. Um, and I don't do that for a couple of reasons. The primary one is that I'm lazy. Uh, I'll be honest. Central admin is different because you can't. So, so we'll step back for most companies. We get a wildcard cert. Yep. Star.contoso.com because then that handles dub, dub, dub that handles portal that handles my site that handles everything. You drop it on all the servers. Everybody's good to go. 
Central Admin doesn't have that. It's just machine name. So then, you know, do you make it machine name dot whatever so you can use the wildcard? Do you get another cert? Do you do a self-signed cert? It gets very complicated, and Central Admin just doesn't get used a lot, I guess. So Yeah, yeah and I completely agree with you. You know, I, I am also a Central Admin meh. But I can tell you that the chat room did not approve of my comment to that. Those guys are uh, much more militant. You know, Dan points out that he changes uh, search for public sites every 12 months. Intranets, he does it every 24 months. I mean, kudos to him. He is He's doing the right thing. He's taking security super seriously. But I, uh, yeah. I've not had that good fortune. No, I've uh, I've not had to do that. So, but and, and then to their PowerShell code signing, yeah. So you know we've done that. We kind of figured it out, and then I kind of got a little nudge there. Apparently, they'd like me to do a video on how to do uh, PowerShell code signing. Um, so yeah, good news, guys. It is now on the PowerShell videos list, which is only one, two, three, four, eight things long. Unlike the Power go. Apps video list, that is over twenty now. Oh my goodness. Yep. And so as we're talking about this, I feel obligated to give a shout out to Digicert. Uh, yes. They are the folks that I get all of my certificates from, and they have, I mean, there's a bunch of different folks out there. I'm sure they're all good. I've had great luck with Digicert. I've had a couple of issues, self-imposed problems. They Their support has always been great. They've got a great tool that you can install on your servers that, that helps that process. Because uh, you don't do cert stuff often once a year probably, uh, and you never remember it. And, and I, so they've got this tool that, that does some great stuff. Uh, so if you're looking for certificates and you don't know where to start, uh, digicert.com is a great place to start. Yeah. And I will tell you guys also, uh, speaking of working with them, you know, they're great, uh, but plan some lead time if you're going to do mm. something like a code signing cert, right? So code signing cert or the first time you kind of work with them, they do a great job of validating who you are, what you are, you know, and all that stuff. And it took me a couple of days to get the cert the first time, which was good. It was a good process. Yep. They were easy to work with. I didn't have all my ducks in a row for answering all their questions to prove that I really was boldzebras.com. So. Yeah. And uh, so to piggyback on that, not only is that the case for code signing, but one of the internet authorities, I don't know if it's ICANN or whoever has changed the requirements. So when I moved my blog, I've had a certificate for toddclint.com for years. Uh, but to just to get it reissued to my new environment, I had to go through all that stuff again because the requirements had changed since I did it last. Yeah. Uh, so that took me a couple of years. So do that. Uh, the other thing that I would recommend is, this is a, a lesson I learned the hard way probably 10 years ago, is when you get your certificate, obviously it expires. I think they expire in a year now. Um, I always put an appointment in Outlook two weeks before that certificate expires to remind me to renew it. Because if not, I set it once, I forget about it, and then all of a sudden people start getting errors and it takes two days to get it set back up. I wonder when my code signing certificate expires. You talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was one of those things. That's just, you know, present Todd helping future Todd out. Um, and the time that I discovered it, it was like the worst time ever. I had set a certificate up for a place that I worked. It was back when I was an internal guy and got the certificate going and everything was great. And the day that it expired, I was moving. So not only was I not at work, but I was super busy and super stressed and everything was in my name. And so my coworker's trying to get the certificate renewed, except he can't get it renewed because he's not me. And it was just I'm like, oh, I'm like, if there's just some way I could have known this a week ago, why didn't they? And so ever since then, yeah. Very cool. All right. So you won against distributed cash. We're bad human beings about what we do with SSL. Keep rolling. Man, we, yeah, good. I was just say we're 20 minutes in already. What are we doing here? Woo. <laughs> uh, another great thing. So one of my uh, PowerShell buddies, Adam Bertram, he just plows out the PowerShell content. Uh, he, good Lord, is he uh, very prolific about that stuff. And he had a good article. And I think that's one that he's... Um, he published, well, no, I guess it is a new one. Uh, so if you go, let me, uh, let me get his URL uh, so I can send you to his site. But uh, it was about using uh, the history commands with PowerShell. Yep. And uh, this is one that I, I find myself doing frequently and more frequently than I think I would ever do. And that's because I'm not very smart. So I spend a lot of time find, figuring things out in PowerShell and, and it being a process. Uh, and then having to use get history to put all the pieces back together once I've got it figured out so that I can blog it or whatever. Uh, and so if you're not already using the command get dash history, now you have it in your arsenal. And there are, you know, verb dash now, and there are a bunch of history 
uh, based commands, get history, um, clear history. You know, if you're doing some stuff you shouldn't be and you're afraid someone's going to come up and uh, do the up arrow. Um, but one that I had never heard of before and that I read in, in Adam's article here is invoke history. And so this is a fun one where um, if you do a get history and see a command that you're running and like I, if, when I'm testing stuff and I'm assigning variables and trying stuff, when you do a get history, you can see the line that you ran and you can do invoke history and just run that line again. So that's pretty cool. So you don't have to up arrow, up arrow, up arrow, get history. Oh, it's number seven, invoke history seven, and it just reruns it. Um, so that was uh, that was a good one. I really I really like that article. So Adam Bertram's the guy. If you're not already following his stuff, following him on Twitter and all that, he is a good one of many good PowerShell resources. And his URL, his website is adamtheautomator.com. And what a fun you a fun domain name that is. Yeah, and so speaking of um, invoke history and smart people with PowerShell, uh, Jeff Hicks woke up. He, yeah, you, you were droning on, but he heard PowerShell enough. He started paying attention, <laughs> uh, right? Because Jeff has given me, he sent me some of his stuff in the past on the, the history playing. So I haven't read Adam's, I've read Jeff's. Um, he reminds you that you can always use the alias of R. We know that Todd and I aren't smart enough to use aliases, so we didn't. Do I don't it. like aliases, <laughs> but uh, they are there. I also had an interesting. Um, chat with Adam the other day on power or on uh, Twitter and I don't, you know, unlike you, he has no idea who I am. So he's like, why is this random guy responding to me? <laughs> but I guess Adam's working on a new book or something for PowerShell. And he's like, you know, should I do it as an all up um, story, right? So one big giant scenario where I just kind of do all the pieces along the way, or should I teach it as individual pieces and not do the story? Um, and so I actually, uh, probably went against the conventional thought process and said, you know, I, I would prefer you did it as a bunch of individual lessons instead of trying to kind of tie it up as one story and kind of push back. And, you know, my thought process and what I've learned from my experience is I find that people, especially people who have no context, who are like brand new to something like PowerShell, they have a hard time extrapolating those little pieces out if they're in Absolutely. the context of a story, right? But if you just say, here's how you use invoke history, is a one concise lesson, then they can learn that and then they can bridge that into your story or more importantly into the story that they're trying to do, you know, the work they're actually trying to accomplish. So I actually went against the popular sentiment. I don't know what your thoughts are, but I find that people learn better without the context than they do with the context when you're trying to create this type of content. I, I agree mostly, but I think, uh, they they need the, the big context is too much. I think they need smaller context. And I, and I go back to how you and I learned PowerShell. Just seeing the usage of invoke history is worthless to me. It puts me to sleep. But seeing a small context of a small reason to use it, that's what makes it stick. Yes. Uh, yeah, in, in a 400 line uh, script that he's walking through and explaining every line, yeah, it gets messed up. But you need a little bit of story part for it to kind of stick, but not the the huge story part. So I don't know, just always an interesting one since I had, you brought up Adam and I'd had that exchange and he's like, why does this guy keep, uh, you know, bothering me on Twitter? Yeah, go. I know Adam, he, he's an MVP and him and I have hung out at the MVP summits a couple of times and uh, yeah, Adam's a good guy. Uh, very helpful. Yeah, I follow him. He's, I like his stuff. I just, uh, I annoyed him. So ha ha. <laughs> you annoy everybody. <sighs> uh, That's true. So one of the big things that came out this weekend, and again, April Fool's Day was this weekend, and so it kind of got lost in that, but this is not an April Fool's joke. Uh, a company called Cloudflare has introduced a new DNS service. <laughs> yes, it's a couple of jazz hands. Um, and it was interesting because DNS, I mean, it feels like we got DNS figured out. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, there, there's, there's some things here and there, but, but for the most part, DNS is DNS and it's been around for, you know, 40 years and it seems to work. Um, but Cloudflare added a, a couple of things that are interesting. I'm not sure if they're good or bad or whatever, but they're, they're, they're interesting. Number one is until Sunday. Well, I guess even since then, if I'm setting up any kind of public DNS stuff, I used to use at home, I've got a, a windows DNS server and I would use root hints. So that means my DNS server actually goes out to the the cluster of servers that owns .com or whatever. Horrible practice. People like me should not be querying the root hints, the, the root servers. But I did that for a while because I didn't trust my ISP's DNS, all that, so that's why I did this. But then a few years ago, uh, Google came out with their own DNS service 
And I started using that mainly so I wouldn't do the root hints thing, but also because it was really easy to remember. You could point any of your DNS servers at 8.8.8.8 or 8.8.4.4. Easy to remember. And then you weren't using your ISP's uh, DNS servers because if you guys remember like eight years ago, so Verizon did this thing, they started inserting commercials into DNS. <laughs> and uh, so, and the way they did that is if you tried to, to resolve a name that didn't exist, Instead of telling you it didn't exist, they would point you to one of their servers that would advertise you to be able to buy it. I mean, it was just crap, just absolute crap. Um, so that's why I kind of like the Google thing and been doing that forever. So I've got some some ad blocking stuff and all that at home. Everything goes through Google and it's worked really well. Cloudflare, uh, one of the big benefits for them is they've got a very memorable address. 1.1.1.1. Yep. Super easy to remember. Uh, probably maybe not more or less easier than 8.8.8, but 1.1.1.1. Um, so that's interesting because it's easy to remember. And we'll talk a little bit about what the, the thing behind that. Um, but the thing that they offer is security. So we talked earlier about SSL and all that. That's a good way to keep people from snooping on the content, but all DNS queries are in the clear. So anybody on the wire, anybody, your ISP, any of that kind of stuff, they might not be able to see the packets that you're going to, but they can see the sites you're going to. And that might be enough for whoever to cause you problems or law enforcement or whatever. There's no way. So one of the things that Cloudflare offers, they offer regular DNS over port 53 and that all works. Um, but they offer this thing called uh, DNS over HTTPS, which has the adorable acronym of DOE. Um, but the way that this works is if your DNS resolver, your DNS client supports it, it can do a DNS query request over HTTPS. So now it's secure. So now that they can't see it. And then the result comes back over HTTPS and it comes in as a JSON package. So then your resolver on, you know, I, I love that for a bunch of different reasons. Um, so they offer that and then they say that it's going to be faster. Uh, and so Jeff in the chat room is saying that he switched over there and has not had any problems and it does seem faster. I don't know that I've seen any problems with DNS. I guess I, I haven't switched over to Cloudflare's thing, so I don't know if it's going to have an appreciable difference in the speed of stuff or not. Um, but that's one thing. So so 1.1.1.1, what's interesting about that address is that is uh, owned by the Asian uh, IP folks. And that has been an address that's been used for a bunch of stuff. So part of why Cloudflare did this was to help those folks go through the crap and the stuff that goes to that address and figure out the bad things that are crawling the internet and all that kind of stuff. But one of the side effects that they found uh, is that there are a bunch of places that use that internally, mm -hmm. kind of like the 192.168 or the 172, uh, you know, 16 bit. And so now there are places that can, block that or are blocking that or are using it for the thing. So they're having some problems with that. Um, but it's all very interesting. I like this idea that we haven't ended the research on DNS and how to make it faster and how to make it better and how to make it more reliable and, and all that. Well, yeah, I mean, because if you think of, was it last year or two years ago when there was, someone did flood all the DNS servers on the East Coast and pretty much took the internet yeah. down and it was yeah. a DNS attack instead of an actual server attack. And yeah, it's... Uh, we are so dependent on the internet and the bubble gum and chewing gum and wire and stick them and duct tape that it's held together with. It's uh, it is nice that some people are thinking about how to remove some of the bubble gum. Yep. And, uh, and Jeff, Jeff in the chat room is using PowerShell. I love it. And showing how the DNS resolvers are, uh, are faster for 1.1.1.1 as opposed to 8.8.8.8. Uh, that's fun. And so hot on the heels of that, uh, I noticed immediately that somebody uh, put up a package on GitHub where they wrote a PowerShell package to use the DNS over HTTPS resolver. So if you don't want to use the built-in tools and, and expose all your DNS requests in clear text, you can use this uh, PowerShell module and do them over uh, HTTPS. So love it. Good stuff. Yeah. So, so the now only question left is, right, is really, you know, is the NSA uh, using cloud for Cloudflare as a front, so now you think you're getting secure DNS, and instead you're getting you're piping it straight into the NSA. Well, and is the NSA really blocked by whatever security is in place? Um, yeah. you, you never know. But I, I definitely like this. Uh, one of the things I'm frustrated by is I use a device called a Pi Hole, which is a Raspberry Pi with you know, and it does some DNS things, protects me from malware and all that. It does not do the secure HTTP stuff yet. 
So I'm, and, and they strike me as the people that would be doing that. Uh, and so I need to, to pay attention to that and see when that shows up and then I'll try it. Well, with the pile, can't you just go out to GitHub, you know, do a pull request and write, write the module yourself? Why did I not think of that? Yeah, I'm just going to do that. I'll do that this afternoon. Uh, just, yeah, just pull that down and write the clippity clap. And uh, someone, someone on Twitter the other day told me that, oh, you can just go do a PR on that. I'm like, huh? What? <laughs> Public know. release? What? I Personal what record? Doing. I don't know what that, yeah. yeah. But that, I mean, it does bring us to our, our friend uh, GitHub. So one of the projects I'm working on now is I'm writing, uh, I wrote, some white papers for a company who shall not be named. They'll be released very soon, and then they'll be named. Um, but it turns out that all of their uh, documentation now goes through GitHub. And so, you know, I'd sent the, uh, the the white paper in. We did the back and forth. It was all good. It was in a nice, happy Word document format. And yesterday morning, they're like, hey, this needs to be all in Markdown in the next 30 or next three hours. Go, Mike. I don't know what Markdown is. <laughs> I mean, I'm being honest. I'd never, I never, yeah. I knew it was no, a I've, language, but I'd never written a single line of markdown nah. in my life. Nope. Um, so I panicked, um, and I started playing with things. And then it turns out that there is this wonderful site um, that just literally takes a word document and converts it to markdown. It it drops out all of the stupid. Um, you know, if you've ever like taken a Word document and converted it to HTML, which you think would be very helpful, you know, Microsoft ends up yeah. putting in their own uh, CSS classes for everything, and it's pretty much trash. Yeah. Uh, so this guy, nope, gets rid of all of that for you. It was literally just, here's my Word document. Here is nice, clean, pristine markdown language. I, I about cried. I was, uh, I was like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> That'd be a million dollars. Um, so... Kudos to that guy. Um, I had his name written down and then I lost it. Ben Balter. Oh, I like Ben. Yeah, so it turns out I guess Ben is actually like a IP, uh, you know, he's a nerd lawyer. So he's a super techie, but he contributes a bunch to the open source. He's a big fan of GitHub apparently because the whole reason he wrote this was to make it so that people like me could get their documentation on GitHub. So kudos to him. The site doesn't do anything. I don't need an email address. I just put it in and it's like, here's your markdown. I'm like, God bless you. So... Ben Balter, if you're listening to the show, good job. You're our hero of the day, Ben. Um, so one one thing, and we've talked about this before, but for anybody who hasn't done it before, Office documents these days are just zip files. So you were talking about all the CSS classes and all that kind of stuff. Any current uh, Office documents, docx, xlsx, pptx, any of that, if you change the extension to .zip, you can just double click it and see all that stuff. Every image you've got in there, every whatever the CSS file Shane was talking about, uh, all of that. And while it probably has zero to no utility to it, it's just cool. It's just interesting to see how all that stuff's put together. Mm -hmm. uh, so I highly recommend doing that. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun, right? Word is such a, uh, such a beast these days. Yeah. So, and as you point out, those all the document forms, all the XLS, X, you know, all the X yeah. ending ones. So, yep. Very cool. But yeah, so that was uh, Save My Butt. And it was, he literally did it just for the reason I was using it. I was like, this is <laughs> That's Sometimes, Shane, sometimes developers aren't terrible. Sometimes, very uh, rarely, but once in a while, you'll see a good developer like Ben. And uh, yeah. So let's, let's jump down to K, my favorite portion of the, the show always. <laughs> hey, yep. Tell me about Power Apps, Shane. Oh, I thought you How do you feel about asked. Power Apps? You've been kind of quiet. What You know, if you had to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, where, where does Power Apps fall in Shane's world right now? I mean, I, I'm assuming that it's going to be Times Person of the Year, right? I mean, they, they can award a, award a Person of the Year category to a piece of software, I think. So I, I'm voting mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, they've they've ordered to a lot of things. So yeah, there you go. Um, so real quick, I thought I would just point out that uh, one of the Power Apps team members put out a blog post on Power Apps performance considerations, um, and so he just kind of broke down some of the different ways of you know querying data and dealing with delegation and collections and stuff. Um, I don't know. I thought it was a good read. Two reasons. One is that while well, it's not a bunch of actionable data, it's kind of like those old days with SharePoint when we used to just read the TechNet documentation, you know, because it was Thursday at three o'clock in the afternoon. It was kind of fun to do. Yeah. Um, so he kind of talks about some of the different methodologies there. And so I thought that was interesting. But then he also, at the end, he kind of 
not on purpose, I don't think, but he ended up writing this neat little thing that kind of explained how to make loading screens using timer controls and putting things into collections. And I thought that that was a really strong takeaway that probably should have been its own blog post that he's kind of buried in the bottom of this performance blog post. It's like, oh, here's, here's a great way to build these uh, interactive, you know, happy experience loading screens. So if you're into power ops at all, it's just one of those things you should read. Even if you just read the whole thing, go, yeah, whatever, I knew that. Roll your eyes, whatever. It's just good stuff to kind of keep the old ticker going. So hopefully in a year when you run into that issue, you're like, wait a minute, that guy wrote something about that and go hunt it back down. Yeah. And to circle this all back, uh, Dan Christian in the chat room is saying that the uh, Power Apps MS app file is also a zip file. So you can change that to .zip and look at the pieces inside of that. Oh, wait, wait, no, no, no. You wanted to read the second thing that Dan posted. I didn't see anything after that. Oh, you didn't see the uh, part then, where he said, I think Shane Young is a Power nope, Apps genius? I, nope, that didn't show up on my screen at all. And then Eric uh, Van Roy mentioned he's amazed at how many files out there that are just zip and .cab with extension changes. Um and that, so I, I agree. But the cool thing about that is that that, that is a uh, a sign of people building on top of stuff. So, you know, the office team has to find some way to compactly move files around. Yeah, they could write their own compression and all that, or they could just use zip or cab and just let those folks deal with that. And then all the tools that I have work with that. I love it. So, and it looks like uh, Dan Christian is trying to get himself kicked out of the chat room. I have that power, Dan. Shane does not. So just keep that in mind as you're uh, typing in there. All right, Dan, we'll start our own Power Apps podcast. It'll be way more popular than this. <laughs> Which is not hard to do, right? Because, you know, if our moms weren't watching, I mean, our viewership would be, what, 10, 12? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's one of the things I do. I set up a new computer for my parents this weekend, and I always uh, make sure my blog is uh, in the favorites bar. Somehow, I don't know what it is. It must be a bug with Edge or whatever that my blog the, the favorite keeps going away, and I keep having to put it back. I don't Part of the syncing, I don't know, uh, but... I'm there for them. See, if you were smarter, you would have pointed it to a Bitcoin mining site, right? Use their, uh, you know, one of your moms on Ebates or whatever those websites are. Get some mi uh, mining going in the background. I just installed that flight. It's in their taskbar. It's oh. it's going. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Um, I'm going to give you this computer, mom and dad. The bad news is it's going to raise your electric bill $75 a month so that I can earn 12 cents in Bitcoin. There, so, yeah. Yes, there you go. <laughs> That's Perfect sense. Uh, so the other one on Power Apps real quick, I did pop out a video at like midnight last Friday because I felt bad I had not done a video all week. And this week is currently building towards me house, so having to do it at midnight again. Um, but I did one on just how to use the timer control. It's um, It seemed like a pretty boring commandlet, so I kind of walked people through how you'd make a stopwatch in which kind of... It's fun for me because you have to wire the other buttons to trigger events of the timer control, which isn't as intuitive as it probably should be. Hint, hint product team um and then i also use it in um, other apps to send people to purgatory so one of the apps that i've written that i have not done the video on yet is a is password protecting a screen and so if you're like todd and you fat finger your password two or three times um, after the third failure i send you off to a screen and i'm like you're just stuck here for two, 10 minutes until uh you know, that's harsh yeah and it's probably not 10 it's probably only one minute but Either way, I send them off into purgatory. So that was my way of putting security around my password lockout screen. And I don't know, I just thought it was a fun little uh, use of showing off how to do the timer control, how to make uh, password protected screens. Because while to me, password protected screens and power apps don't make a lot of sense because we know other security things, people kept asking. So I'm like, all right, I, I can solve this problem. Let's do it. That's, that's good stuff. Yeah, that's, um, and I do fat finger my password a lot. That is a true story. So uh, that, that's all the power app news I have for the week. I'm very, I feel, I feel like I'm letting everyone down. I know this is the yeah. most popular well, segment. Well, you're letting everybody down. Let's have no confusion about that. Um, so I, I feel like we've talked about the next one a bunch of times, but I never know where in the process of it we are. But apparently there's a new SharePoint admin interface out something just like I don't general, I don't I have no idea. Yeah, I, I'm with you, right? So um, last week, Bill Bear blogged or tweeted or something, you know, Carrier Pigeon, woof, if you've ever seen The Office. Uh, but he sent out a thing, you know, saying the SharePoint Admin Center Preview had added a bunch of new features, you know, different customizations, different abilities to download, uh, views and that type of stuff. So I don't know. I, I'm with Todd. I cannot keep up with what has changed and what hasn't, what we've told you or what we haven't. So just know if you're into the SharePoint Admin Center, it looks like there's another round and there's a link in the show notes if you want to read kind of the 
the breakdown of these features, but how these are different than the last time we had the announcement features, I got nothing. Yeah, and I think probably the biggest uh, benefit, if, I, if I'm remembering how everything bolts together, is the new SharePoint Admin Center shows you the site collections that are created by things like Teams and all that, and the old one does not. If I remember, uh, that was the big benefit for me because I had, we, we've played in Teams some, and so I had some site collections out there that were created by Teams and they didn't show up and I had to switch to the new one to see it. Gotcha. Um, so a uh, couple real quick ones also. I just want to make sure we get in because we're running out of time here. Yeah. Um, so Power BI, um, I've got to deal with teaching some people that tonight. And so as part of that, um, Eric, Eric Alexander recommended that I use the Office 365 adoption pack which is in preview that kind of shows you a bunch of you can connect power bi to your office 365 feed and then it can, you can build dashboards that kind of show you what uh, people are doing and using which was really interesting i was like oh i get this i like this but i can tell you guys it's a pain in the butt to set up and apparently because apparently you have to like first go into the office 365 admin center and say that this pack is allowed to run and then you have to wait on that to process and then you can use the pack. I don't know. So I'm kind of excited about it, but I can tell you I've had a hard time getting it going, so I don't have a lot to share there yet. Um, also, speaking of shout-outs, I don't know if you guys have got kids like I do. I know you have kids like I do. But apparently <laughs> the kids these days are into Fortnite, which is like a new version of Minecraft, it's like, kind of. Like, it's like two weeks? That Fortnite? No, no, no. Fortnite is just like game where you do this battle royale like a hundred people get dropped on a deserted island and the storm is coming so the area gets smaller and the last man or woman standing is the winner but it's not like just straight up battles like you got a minute to like get your stuff around and find treasures and build stuff and you can hide in houses i don't know it's an interesting thing i haven't done it enough to understand it completely but i can tell you that the kids are loving it and to play it on ios devices though they're in preview and so to get into the locked beta, you have to get someone who's in to give you a code. And so anyway, Scott Hogue was kind enough to give me a code so I get it installed on my machine so then I can give my kids a code. I don't know. So I just want to give him a shout out. I need to figure out what Fortnite is, but apparently it's based in the chat room, a bunch of people's kids are playing it. Uh, so what do you do? Yeah, and Scott Hogue is definitely somebody you should be following. Uh, and I I forget what his Twitter handle is. Uh, but he also, I think he's got a podcast of some variety. Oh. You should have you should have uh, provided me more. So Cypher TXT is his Twitter handle. Yes. Uh, so go follow him there. And he's got I think he's got all of his link stuff. And then yeah, MSIT Cloud Pro is a podcast that he and Ben do, I believe. So yeah, so I, yeah, doing them. a terrible job. I'm glad you're here to uh, do a better job for my shout out. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Ben's or uh, uh, Scott's a great guy. No, known Scott forever. Great guy, super smart. Uh, you could do a lot worse than uh, being friends with with Scott. Uh, all right, I think we can skip I think, H. I think we can roll out. Yeah, the the, the audience will never know what H was. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, just one of the mysteries of the ages. So uh, not a lot of changes in the community corner this week. Uh, this Saturday is SharePoint Saturday Omaha. I've been working on my uh, things for that. I'm doing the keynote on the state of SharePoint. Uh, the state of my presentation on the state of SharePoint is uh, progressing slowly, but, uh, but I'll, I'll have it ready uh, Saturday morning. Uh, and then I'm doing a session on PowerShell with Office 365. And so I'm in the process of uh, updating all of my links and all that because the, Microsoft's been moving their documentation to docs.microsoft.com and a bunch of things have moved since I did that talk last. So just kind of getting up to speed on all that. But that is April 7th, SPS Omaha. Hopefully I'll see you there. If you, there's no chance you'll hear this podcast before Saturday, uh, but uh, would love to see you there. Um, then SharePoint Saturday, Vancouver is April 14th. Uh, May 4th and 5th is Cloud Friday Nashville and SPS Nashville, so I like that. Uh, they did those back-to-back. -back. That's very, very smart of them to do that. Um, SharePoint Saturday Montreal is June 2nd. And then SharePoint Saturday Charlotte, our man Dan Christian from the chat room is, uh, is heading that one up, and that's uh, August 11th down in Charlotte. Very cool. Lots of events. The spring is popular. Busy, busy. Uh, not to be forgotten, but in a month, holy cow, is it just like a month and a couple weeks, okay? Oh. SharePoint Conference North America. 
Holy cow. Uh, very excited about that. That's starting to come together, starting to make plans. It's starting to become a real thing. I just, I was talking to a customer yesterday on the phone and he was you know, talking about all the different sessions going on in the workshops and it's, man, it's, it's, it's reality. I'm getting excited. Yeah. I need to book my travel speaking of that. Oops. Yes. Yeah, I do too. I booked my, uh, uh, hotel yesterday. So if you haven't done that, please do that. I, I, I done that. I just hadn't done, cause they made me do that like a month ago. Anyway, people don't care, but yeah, done. Uh, uh, so that is May 21st through the 23rd. If you have not registered for that yet, go to SharePointNA.com and get all signed up for that. And it's it's folks like Shane and I, it's uh, Microsoft is sending everybody, I believe, uh, to this conference. It is going to be huge. Um, so go to SharePointNA.com. So we have notes here. And there are many of us that have access to this OneNote. It gets very confusing as things change, as you know, more information plays on. So initially, the referral code was a word that I can't say. Uh, and then the referral code was my last name, Clint, K-L-I-N-D-T. And then I noticed, uh, as I read through it now, now the referral code is Gowan. And I don't even think that one works. I'm not sure how you spell that. I think, uh, yeah, I wouldn't use that one. Uh, but many referral codes gets you 50 bucks off. Uh, and lots of uh, lots of appreciation from whoever's code you worked. Yeah, when it looks like in the chat room's asking, right, are there discount codes that are easy to spell, right? Because Clint is very complicated. Gowan is not even really a word. But Young, it turns out Y-O-U-N-G. We all learned to spell that like in the first grade. So that seems like the best code to use. Yeah, um, I think you're all wrong. I think anybody who, I mean, I, everybody knows how to spell my name. Anybody that's anybody. If you don't know how to spell my name, it's probably because you got that you know, Kentucky education that you got, Shane, or uh, or something. Uh, but so for Shane and I, we're going to be doing a post-con on Thursday on administration. We're doing a couple sessions during the week, which I've forgotten what they are. Um, we're going to be doing the podcast live from there. So if you want to be in the audience for that, uh, let us know. And then we'll have some kind of get together, a breakfast or a lunch or something. Where we'll just hang out and uh, riff on each other and let you guys uh, join in. Yeah. So... I think I'm also going to bring, um, I'm, I'm going to have a new uh, new piece of swag to go with the, the thing that I'm still not telling anybody about over my left shoulder. Oh, so. goodness sakes. And, you, and you, you remembered which one was left, so that's good. That's, <laughs> I, mean, uh, I had to like, you know, plan that. Which, which is funny because, I mean, I get it when you watch yourself, I've done that mistake. But you know over which shoulder that sign is. Like even if I said it's over your, you know, 14 shoulder, you still know it's. So the problem, the reason for this, honestly, is usually when I'm talking about the wall, for like, you know, all 800 of my YouTube videos, I always talk to the wall That's true. on this side. So, so I, I don't know in the first video where I have to be like, I, I'm like, I don't even know how to roll my shoulders that way. I'm like, yeah, like ah, oh, so it, it hurts. It's got to go down. I don't, yeah, I mean, it's going to be awkward. I, I just, I haven't pointed that way before. Yep. Uh, and in the chat room, Jan, Dan is mentioning that breakfast with me is awesome. Uh, Dan and I, uh, we, we ended up with this tradition at the MVP summit last month where we just happened to, our, our cycles got in sync and we would get up at the same time. We would head down to breakfast at the same time. It was, it was the highlight of my day. It was, it was a good time. So that's, uh, wait, did you just say you're buying breakfast for everyone that comes? Is that what I just heard? <laughs> I will buy conference breakfast for everybody <laughs> that shows up. Yes. Yep. Uh, and then finally, uh, SP TechCon is going to be in Boston this year. That's August 26th through 29th at sptechcon.com. Um, a lot of us, Shane and I and Lori, I think, are all part of the committees that are picking out the sessions. And there was a lot of great content in there. Uh, I was amazed at all of the people who submitted things. And it was very obvious what the trends were in the business because – there were a lot of people submitting the same sessions on the same topics. So that gave me a great idea where things were going, but that looks like that's going to be a, a great conference, a hell of a conference. <sighs> that's a lot. We 50 minutes, man. We kind of went over. You better, you better say goodbye to these people quick. Everybody. Thanks for sticking with us for 50 minutes. If you have, uh, I will get this put out eventually and we will uh, see you next week on the podcast. To lose.